All right. Okay. Well, you know, it is Father's Day, and, and so I, I, I need to tell you some Father's Day um, jokes because I like Father's Day jokes, and I know they're a little bit corny, and that's why we can them. Um, but uh, why do we call seagulls seagulls? Because if they flew over the bay, they'd be bagels. Well, that really lasted pretty good. That was a nice little... <laughs> all right, all right, all right, all right, okay. What, what days are the strongest of the week? Saturday and Sunday. Because of the rest of the days are weak. I had to ground my son for chewing electric cords. He's currently doing well and conducting himself properly. If money does not grow on trees, then why do banks have branches? <laughs> why don't scientists trust atoms? Because they make up everything. <laughs> what do you call a bear without teeth? A gummy bear. Thank you so much. And how do you make a tissue dance? Put a little boogie in it. You guys know that one. All right. I'll, you know, I tried. I tried. I tried. Well, it's so good to see everyone today, and we're happy that you're here on, on Father's Day. And we're going through the book of Ephesians, which pretty much is from, I, from identity to destiny. And by the way, let me say something about fathers today. Fathers, our major role God has given us is to be christ like Christ is to the church, and men give identity to society. So do women, but men have a special place in bringing identity. I don't know if you realize this, but what happens is when you have a male and a female, and you have uh, the eggs matching with the man's seed, the man determines the sex of the child. I don't know if you realize that biologically. Also, it's very important, society has taught us, that men should speak life over their children. Men, we have an opportunity to speak identity. And in a culture today that's very confused, we need men to stand up and speak the truth in love. Amen? Amen. amen. And by the way, amen doesn't have nothing to do with men. I'm sorry to tell you. Amen means so be it. One time someone said, I'm not going to say amen, I'm going to say a woman. Well, he doesn't understand. All right, back to that. Here we are today, a book of Ephesians. And how many of you guys ever feel exhausted? I mean, just get exhausted. I hear, I mean, I hear all the time today when I talk to someone, how are you doing? Oh, man, I'm tired. I'm tired. You know, I'm tired. I hear, how many people hear that? I always hear, I'm tired. I'm exhausted. I'm overwhelmed. I got so much to do. I, I hear it all the time. I hear it from 14-year-olds to 44-year-olds to 94-year-olds. In fact, usually the 94-year-olds are not that tired. But it seems like everyone's, like everyone's tired and exhausted. Why is that? Why do we all kind of get in this place where we're just completely flabbergasted and we're going through difficult times? Well, you know, it's very interesting that there's been a bunch of studies told that what you're finding out, there's this rise in anxiety and depression. In America Day, the ADAA reports that anxiety disorders are the most common mental health. Right now, the number one mental health challenge in America today is anxiety, affecting right now acute anxiety to 40 million Americans. And it's called GAD, Generalized Anxiety Disorder. It is a huge problem, and it's getting worse. And teenagers and those that are growing up now have a very high percentage of it, and it's getting worse. And, and basically, they're saying that one of the reasons why is that social media has created such a plethora of comparison that it's caused the teenagers, in particular, and by the way, the adults as well. How many of you are getting jealous of people's vacations? You're all lying. Okay? I mean, think about it. We, we're constantly looking at other people, what they're doing. We're comparing ourselves. And the truth of the matter is that human beings are not created to have all this influence of other people. We only can really, truthfully, you can really have three to five best friends. 
That's really all you're capable of doing. Maybe 15 that are associates, but by and large, you don't have that kind of power or time. But what's happened is we spread ourselves so thin, we're so concerned what our image is outside, and we compare ourselves to other people. What happens is we find ourselves exhausted. I can't keep up with this person. I can't do this or the other. And we try to put on these airs of who we're at. And so that's part of it. So depression, anxiety, mental health has become a tremendous problem because what's happened is the social media and uh, social media and social influencers have actually made us more separated. As, and I'm not saying that these things are bad, but they can be used very poorly. What can happen is we're always, I, or, or, listen, we're always on call, right? I, mean, I remember the day, I'm going to date myself here just a little bit, but I remember the day where I used to go, go up for water and uh, go up to the hill and I used to pump it. Then I used to go in an outhouse. I'm just kidding. It didn't happen. <laughs> but I remember the days before cell phones. Do you remember that? And so I remember in like 1994, I was in graduate school and I went to a restaurant and this, this, this guy, this yuppie comes in. Hair slicked back, he has a suit with a little hanky here, comes in, the, comes in the coffee shop, sits down, he's sitting there, and he takes out a bag phone. We heard a bag, bag ladies, well, this is the bag phone. He takes out a bag phone, he starts talking on the phone, talking about, talking about trading and all that. My friend and I look at each other and go, who does this guy think he is? He's so arrogant that he has to talk on the phone in a restaurant. You guys remember thinking that? Right? You guys are like, what are you talking about? If you, if you don't know what we're talking about, you didn't know what it was like to not to have cell phones. Now today, everyone is on a phone all the time, right? And, we have, and it's, it was considered rude to be in a restaurant, to be on the phone. It was considered bad etiquette today. All right? Today, it's like it's standard fare. In fact, you better tell your children to put the phones away at the table and then to put yours away as well. <laughs> And so we constantly have this today, and so so much stress. We can't seem to get away from social media. We can't get away, and now this is supposed to make our life easier. Now I have to check WhatsApp, Instagram, Facebook, right? Uh, Facebook Marketplace for the things I'm trying to sell. Uh, I'm trying to keep up with all these things, and if I don't get the back to someone with text messaging, or remember, there's an old thing. We don't really use it too much anymore. It's called email. All these things I have to keep up with, it's too much, right? So we find ourselves constantly stressed out. We find ourselves overloaded with stress. And we find ourselves, instead of being human beings, we become human doings. We're not being anymore, we're doing. And we're constantly like a rat on a, on a, on a, on a wheel, constantly running. So how do we overcome this? Well, this is what Jesus tells us. And this, I want to encourage you today, our whole sermon series has been about identity right? Your identity leads to your destiny, but the only way you're really going to know your identity is you have to understand something. What we're calling you to do is very simple. All of Christ in all of me. All of Christ in all of me. Can we say that together? All of Christ in all of me. This is what the whole time today is all about. The problem is we are so filled with so many things. In fact, I didn't like going to church for a while because every time I came to church, I found out what else I'm doing wrong, right? Last week, I wasn't reading my Bible enough. This week, I didn't forgive my mother and father-in-law enough. The other week, I'm drinking too much tobacco. <laughs> I didn't know you could drink tobacco unless you chew it. Anyhow, so, yeah, and, and, and every week, there's something new I have to, you should be giving more. You should go on a mission trip. And you come to church, and they give you this huge to-do list, and I got enough things around the house. I got to power wash the house. I got to weed whack. I got to cut the lawn, right? I got to dust. I had to do all this. I had to do my taxes, which I, I just did already, by the way. But anyhow, I had to do all these things, and it's just another thing. Why do I want to go to church and find out what else I'm doing wrong? I feel so behind already. And so church becomes a big weight of what I'm doing wrong. And if I go to church and I get beat up, oh, I got beat up today. I felt the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And nothing changes. Just more and more expectations. And the more expectations I have upon them, the more exhausted I get. In fact, frankly, I can't do this anymore. I can't be as good as these other people. And when you look at social media sometimes, it exhausts me. I mean, how does this person do all these things? And by the way, the, the social media are highlight reels of someone's life. Truth of the matter is, they have filters on there. In fact, I, I learned on Zoom, I had filters. I could actually put more hair on my head. 
I got rid of my crow's feet. Now I have no feet on my eyes. My teeth got so white it blinded me. It's fantastic. I actually put a, you can actually put a goat tee on yourself. I mean, I grew one. It's kind of, kind of, I actually put a goat tee on. I could give myself eyebrows. And this is on Zoom. And then you can actually like make it, you can actually make it touch up your look. And I kid you not, ladies, you can put lipstick on Zoom without putting lipstick on. You put, actually, you put lipstick. I did it as a joke to my friends. What are you doing? It is June, but that's beside the point. Um, that was bad. All right, let's move on. That's fine. You never know what you're going to get when you come to Cornerstone. Okay, let's get back to the scriptures. Then Jesus said, Come to me, all of you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Now, so Jesus is basically saying, Listen, I get it. You're exhausted, you're frustrated. You're trying to make things happen. Jesus, come to me. All of you are heavy laden. It seems to me when you go to church, come to me, and I'll give you more things that you have to do, and you're doing wrong. Jesus says, come to me. All you are heavy laden. Like, I'm carrying a lot. So Jesus gives us an invitation to come to him. Now, what's this all about? And carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. Rest actually here means psychological and physical rest. A rest where you're not bothered by things. A rest where you're content. Take my yoke upon you. Now, can I just give you a little bit of a history lesson? When I was a kid, I never understood this, this scripture verse. Yoke. You have to break the yoke. I heard your pastor say, we got to break the yoke. I'm like, what is he talking about? I broke the yoke this morning with my toast. I didn't know what it meant. Well, actually, yoke is something you put on your shoulder. That if you were going to have cattle or, or cows or, or horses, you'd put this yoke and you'd put it on a two or three horses and this yoke allowed you to work together in unity and uniformity. So a one, one horse could pull 7,000 pounds. You'd think two horses could pull 14. It's about 21 to 25,000 pounds because they're yoked together. So what Jesus is saying, he says, take my yoke upon you. The only way you and I can take Jesus' yoke is we have to get rid of our yoke. It ain't no joke. All right, thank you. It is Father's Day. We have to be, what do you call it? Thank you. So what you get to take my yoke. So we have to do is, is get down. And we have to get that yoke off of us and get that yoke of our society off of us. Get the religious yoke off of us. I don't know about you, but I'm exhausted trying to make everyone happy. I'm exhausted trying to be a great dad. I'm exhausted trying to be a great pastor. I'm exhausted trying not to eat the wrong thing. I just go, and that's why we had the food there to tempt you. But it goes on and on. And that's why we have an ice cream truck after this. Okay, let's move forward. But we're always trying not to do something. It's exhausting. I don't want to go to church. I don't want to hear what I'm doing wrong. Well, I have good news for you. Jesus has a better solution. What he's asking us to do is to take his yoke. Take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle. You know what the greatest power Christ has? Humble. What's the, what's the, what's the opposite of being humble? Before the fall comes, we need to have a month that celebrates humility. In fact, our lives should be a celebration of humility, thinking less of ourselves and more of God, of not thinking more than we ought to. Do you know the first, do you know the first sin in the Bible that created all this mess? It was, in, it was Satan and Isaiah. He said, I will lift myself higher than the most morning star. And the, what brought Satan down was pride. He is an expert in pride. Why is it that pride is being used as a weapon against us where it's, now, it's not good to be proud? It's good to be confident. It's good to be grateful. But we must be a, a, must be a humble people. And you know what? You can, be pride, you can be proud going against pride. So what we should do, in order to fight a spiritual force such as pride, we have to do the exact opposite, not the same. And what I see today is I see pride against pride against pride against pride. God wants us to be humble. Jesus was humble. How could Jesus be humble? Moses was the most humble man in the Bible, in the Old Testament. He even wrote it about himself. He was. But humble. And, and, and willing to step down and help other people out. So take my yoke upon you. Let me teach you because I am humble and gentle to heart. And you will find rest for your soul. So we've got to be humble. 
Bold in the Lord, but humble. For my yoke is easy to bear, and the burden I give you is light. So let me teach you. So what we want to do, what do we have to do? All of Christ in all of me. All of Christ in all of me. That's what he's asking us to do. He's not asking us to do more. He's asking us to be. To be or not to be? Just to be. Stop being a human copier. Stop being a human doing. We need to be human beings. We need to be in the presence of God. Does that mean I do nothing? No. What happens is this, everybody. When you let God take over your lives, when you surrender to him, he'll tell you what you need to know at the moment. If you try to change everything at once, it will exhaust you, which brings us to the point of this whole series is your identity brings you to your destiny. All of Christ in all of me. All right, so last week we spoke about something very important. We mentioned the fact that our lives are not just the here and now. I mentioned to you that a phrase that I often say is the best days are always ahead for those in Christ Jesus. And the reason I say that for is not because of this life only. It's because of the life we're going to have on the other side of this life. That we are in a womb called the earth, and one day we'd be birthed into eternity. What happens here matters. And I also mentioned last week that angels and demons and principalities are looking at us. We are a case study of God's providence. And you may not understand your life right now. If I were to go to this screen right here, and I go real, 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 real close, all I see are little pixels. And the problem is, in this life, you can only get so far from the pixels. Only God can pull back and see of all of history. So you and I can ask God questions, we can search for truth, but there comes a point in time we have to trust God. We're not called to be God. We're not called to have it all figured out. God wants us to use a mind, that's why he gave us a mind, but there are times we're just not going to know. So we mentioned last week, I'll go ahead and show you the scriptures, we mentioned that. And we also mentioned this, your identity leads to your destiny. Remember that? I am, therefore I do. I am, therefore I do. I don't do, therefore I am. First comes my identity leads me to how I act. So if you want to change your life, you don't change your behavior first. You change what you think about yourself. That is key. How you think drives you to where you're going. Now, I, that works whether you're a Christian or not. But when you are a follower of Jesus Christ, you think the right thoughts and then couple that with the Holy Spirit and Christian community, you can see miracles begin to happen. But miracles don't happen if we don't do these things. It's important. Your identity leads to your destiny. Remember we mentioned this. Identity. We cannot find who we are without knowing who God is. And if we want to change our destiny, we must change what we think about God and what we think about ourselves. Remember, I'm saying this week in and week out because I want this to stick. Two most important thoughts you can ever have is what you think about God and what you think about yourself. So Ephesians is all about identity. How appropriate is it to talk about identity in a month that focuses so much on it? We are in Christ. This is what it's all about. Who are you? We talked about that. So now we go back to last week, okay? Track with me here a little bit. So that though through the church, the manifold wisdom of God, left last week, may be made known to the rulers and authorities and heavenly places. So we are literally speaking to God's created order beyond the even understanding of what created order is. They're doing particle smashing in Europe. And they're finding a string theory and all kinds of things about, about molecules and, 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 and different worlds. And they're even uh, po- hypothesizing about other worlds that are other realities. Of course, we know that already. There's a spiritual realm going on. And right here, right now, there is a spiritual realm. Right now, why I'm in talking to you right now, there are angels and there are demons. And this presence of God is in this place right now. As I speak to you, it's happening right now. You lost your mind. I have not lost my mind. It's in the scriptures. And I think you can sense something's here beyond just here. I pray you come to Cornerstone, you don't just see us. I pray that you sense God is here because that we want to create a hospitable environment where Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, the love of the Father, the love of the Son, the power of the Holy Spirit is present here. So that through the church, manifold wisdom of God may be known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly places. So what you're doing, you don't know the complete impact of your life this side of heaven. Some of you feel like you, you, you have nothing to show, but God's going to do something great through your life. I need to tell the story for somebody today, but there was a man by the name of Albert McMacken. You probably never heard of the guy. This guy was a farmer, and he used to drive a farmer truck, and he's this young kid, a blonde, blue-eyed kid. 
He said, hey, listen, why don't you uh, come with me to the tent meeting we're having here? Uh, I'll let you drive my truck. So the little boy, the teenage boy of 14 years old came, and he went to the tent meeting night in, night out. And finally, the last time, the last night of the tent, that little 14-year-old boy, because of Albert McMacken, went front and gave his life to Jesus Christ. That 14-year-old boy has preached to over a billion people at one time through, all, through media and through stadium events and has been the counselor to nine U.S. presidents. Of course, that is... Billy Graham. Now, we don't know who Albert McMacken is. You don't know the impact you may have. It's just you saying nice hi to somebody. Jesus loves you might stop them from committing suicide. You don't know. Maybe what you're saying will bridge the gap to go to the next level. So we don't know what we're called to do in the side of heaven, but i called to do this, surrender. I must surrender. All of Christ in all of me can only happen when I get rid of me and let thee be. So we talked about that. In whom we have boldness and access with confidence through what? Our faith in him. What is faith? Faith is trusting. Faith is trusting in God. That's the, the Bible says Abraham believed and it was called righteousness. Faith is just trusting. For example, if there's a fire and there's eight stories up, and there's a little boy. This is a true story. There's a little boy that had to jump out because the fire was coming, and the fireman said before, jump, I can see you. I can't see you. Trust me, jump. And the boy jumps and is saved because he trusted. That's called faith. It isn't reckless faith because we have evidence that Jesus loves us. So we have to be willing to lay down. The smartest thing you can do is realize you don't know everything. The biggest fool in the world is the person who knows everything. And if you're just ripping your, if you're ripping your spouse, you're probably the problem, not them. <laughs> There's little hope for someone that knows everything. One thing I've learned, and you probably learned it the same, you've been around, around for a while. The more I grow in Christ, the more I realize I don't know. And so we talk about that. So we have to have faith in him. And so the apostle Paul says the following. By the way, he's in prison. This is 10 years after he spent uh, almost two and a half years in Ephesus, which is a modern-day Turkey, uh, ten years after this, he was, he, was five, he was in prison for over five years the first time, and he's writing these letters to the region of Ephesus. And he says the following, So I ask you, do not lose heart over what I'm suffering for you. See, the apostle Paul understands there's more to this life than this life. I'm doing more than I'm doing right here. That I am part of God's plan. And so we have to understand there's more to this life than what we're experiencing. And now we go to today's passage where we're going to spend our time. Okay, you guys ready? All right, here we go. So, over what I am suffering for, which is your glory. For this reason, what reason? For everything he just spoke about in the last uh, two and a half chapters, three chapters. For this reason, I bow my knees before the Father. You know what it means to bow your knees? You know, praying in those days, lifting up holy hands, and you would speak out loud. There's not too many places in the Old Testament that talks about bowing, but the Apostle Paul says, I bow bow my knee, which what you would do for a king. You are submitting yourself. You're being something, you're being the opposite of proud. You're submitting yourself to Jesus Christ. I'm not submitting myself to my emotions. I'm not sitting, submitting myself to what society says. I'm submitting myself to what God says, and that's humility. So for this reason, I bow my knees before the Father, and the Father, right there, Father, Abba, Abba is a term of endearment. And so we're not just talking to some great power in the sky. It's not some big energy force like Star Wars, nor is it some absent-minded uh, man who's senile who doesn't know what's going on in heaven. No, we're talking about a powerful, wonderful, incredible God who's here for us, who loves us. I bow my knees before the Father for whom every family in heaven on earth is named. So we have a Father and we have to submit ourselves to the Father. That according to the riches of his glory. Glory is his presence and what he's doing. Let, let me tell you a story. I've, I've said it before, but it's such an impactful part of my life. I want to share it with you again today because it will help some of you to understand about God the Father. Some of you struggle. You had a bad father. Maybe your dad abused you. Maybe your father molested you. I wish I could say what I'm saying is not true. It is more true than I would ever hope to, to dare to believe. But you have a loving father who loves you. 
Back in 1975, 76, my parents were going through, they're married 62 years now, they're going through a really hard time in their marriage. In fact, they were at the verge of divorce. It was a silent battle. I had no idea what was going on. They never argued, they never raised their voice, but my, but my mother and father were not in love with each other. I don't go into all the detail, but what happened is I began to react to, the, to response to that. I'm a feeler. I had nightmares and dreams of demons. It was awful what I was going through. Awful. And in, and in school, I started beating people up. Now, I know it's hard to believe that I would do that. But I was punching kids. I was throwing things at people. Uh, in fact, I got thrown out of the class so many times. I had to go to principal's office constantly. They thought there was something wrong with me because I kept getting violent. They had me to see a, 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 a school counselor. They kicked me out of the school. They wanted to send me to a special school with these kids that are angry and are acting out. They have, before they even discovered behavior modification, I was a wreck because I was reacting. My parents were beside themselves, so they brought me to this school called South Shore Christian School in Merrick, New York, in Long Island, a Baptist church. So I went to the school, and, it, you know, and I went to the school, and there was a principal by the name of Reverend Herb, and that's an interesting nerd name, Reverend Herb. Now, this guy, to me, he was about seven foot five. He probably was about five foot ten, like myself, or maybe six foot three, like I think I am. He had woolly white hair. He had a little bit of a mid-size, mid, you know, he had a little bit of a section here, okay? And he had blue eyes. And he came to me and he said, he said, Eric, I just want to let you know something. God loves you and I love you. He looks straight in his eye with his blue eyes. He says, I want to encourage you to go to the class. He says, anytime you need to cry, you can come down and speak to me. And I'll bring him my office. He said, in my office, he put his hand on my back. And he looked me straight in the eye and said, you, God has good plans for you. It's going to be okay. Anytime you feel fearful or anxiety or anything, you, you said to the teacher, I need to talk to the principal herb. And she'll give you a pass. You can come down here. And then he, looked at the, he brought, picked up a paddle. However, if you misbehave, because my parents gave permission. This is the good old days. <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. I, spare the rod, spare the child. Pastor, you're, I know, I'll get myself into trouble. But it has to be done in, with, anyhow. We'll get to that next time. I'll have Pastor Ronnie speak about spanking. <laughs> All right. So he took the paddle and says, if you act up, you're going to get this. He never had to use it. He gave me something I needed. He gave me self-worth. He gave me love and discipline. To this day, when I think of God the Father, I think of my dad, but I think of Reverend Herb. God bless him. Does he know that one day that little boy in his office would be on a stage preaching the word, of, had the privilege to preach the word of God to people every single week? Would he know the impact he made on my life? You do not know the impact that you can have. Now, what do I say that for? Maybe you're not a dad, but maybe you can be a surrogate person, a man that can reach out to a young boy and be a blessing. My life changed because of Reverend Herb. And so that, in many ways, that's the kind of the strength that the Father has given us, right? The Father, that Abba Father. He's not some wimpy dude. No, he loves. If, if you hate your son, don't discipline him. That's what the Bible talks about. If you hate your children, don't discipline them. So that according to the riches of his glory, that he may grant to you strength and power through what? Through the Spirit. God wants to grant us strength and power through the Spirit. Not by you trying harder. It's not about trying harder. You see, you can try as hard as you want. I've never heard of anyone surrendering too much. You can never overdo surrendering to God. But you can overdo trying for God. Surrendering to God. And letting God have his way. What is that supposed to mean? Let go and let God. I hate those type of phrases. They're so obnoxious. What is that supposed to mean, Pastor? Let go and let God. Okay, thanks a lot. What is it? We'll get into that in a few moments. What it means to let go and let God. Strengthen with his power through his spirit in what? Your inner being. Remember we talked about this, that I believe we're triune beings, that we have a body, we have a soul, which concludes our mind, our will, and our emotions, and we have a spirit. By the way, our body matters to God. One day you'll have a glorified body, and some of the attributes you have you'll see in heaven. But thankfully, I'm sure we'll get rid of the midsection problems we have, right? All right, we're going to be, we're going to be, our, we're going to be, the, the, we're going to be a, the best filter you ever saw of ourselves. But seriously, we're going to have a glorified body in heaven. But what happens is this. 
what happens is God lives with inside of you. And you give your life to Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit is resident inside of you. And we should ask for the baptism to be and filled with the Holy Spirit. Lord, I need to be filled with your Holy Spirit. What happens is Jesus said, out of your innermost being will flow rivers of living water. He's talking about the Holy Spirit that was not yet given. And so what happens is the Spirit of God is inside of us. This is why the greatest lie has the greatest amount of truth. People say, look within. You are all gods. Look within yourself. Right? No. You look within yourself. That's true. But the truth of the matter is I go to the source. There is a deep aqueduct that goes down to a raging river called the Holy Spirit. And we used to sing a song in the 1990s called Let the River Flow. Remember that? Let the river, let the river flow. Holy Spirit, come, move in power. Let the river, not, not try harder. No, let the river flow. I'm going to let the Holy Spirit flow out of me. So what I want to do is, is to surrender the, the boulders, the boulder of unforgiveness. And we'll get into it in a few moments. So what we want to do is let the Spirit of God flow out of the innermost being will flow rivers of living water. So it's not about doing more. It's about surrendering more. All of Christ in all of me. This is what we want to be able to do. See, that according to the riches of his glory, he may grant to you strengthened with power through his what? His Spirit in your inner being so that Christ may dwell. Now the word dwell there is not a house guest. When it says dwell, it's like moving into a house and you pull out that ugly wallpaper, you change the counters, you change the roof, right? And so some of us have invited Jesus into our house and he comes. How many folks like having guests come over? You quickly clean the house, right? And you throw everything in one room. <laughs> it's good to have a bed that's high up. That way you can have long a long comforter, and you throw all the stuff underneath the bed. Right? I never, I mean, one of the best things about having home groups is it keeps your house clean. That's why we don't have home groups. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. I didn't say that. Yes, I did. Okay. So b bottom line is this. We all have stuff going on in our lives. We have a house. And so what we want to do is give Jesus our house. If I invite him to our house, come into the living room, Jesus. Oh, no, no. no don't go in that room, with Jesus. Just go in these rooms only. And so Jesus, maybe he's a drive-by. He just drives by and waves. Hey, Jesus. Maybe we drive by Jesus on Sunday. Hey, Jesus. Love you, Jesus. Good to see you, Jesus. I even listened to Caleb. <laughs> All right? And so, and so you, you do that. And then maybe you invite him on your porch. And then you let him in your living room. But Jesus does not want to be a house guest. You know, we say it all the time. Make yourself at home. If I ever come to your house, you say, make yourself at home. And if I go in your refrigerator, I, I start going around your house. You're like, what are you doing? Well, you told me to make myself at home. We do the same thing to Jesus. Jesus, make yourself home in my life. And then we have Corinth. Oh, no, can't have that. No, no, I, I got to listen to that type of music. I want to read that. I can't forget this person. I can't do the other, right? I need to have this relationship with this somebody. What we need to do, everybody, is we need to hand the deed to the house to Jesus. Because he knows better how to run your house than you do. And so when we make Jesus our home in the Christ may dwell, this is the surrender. It's not about me doing all the work. It's me surrendering. I don't understand. Don't I still have to do the work? Yes, but he does it in sequence. He does it in a way that's easier, which we're going to explain in a few moments, okay? That Christ may dwell in your hearts through Faith. All you have to do is trust and believe. Jump out of the window. He is going to catch you. Jesus said the following in John 14, 23. This is part of, you want to know how to change your life, everybody? How do I do it? You got to surrender. This is what it's all about. Jesus answered to him, if anyone loves me, if you love me, all right, he will what? Keep my word. And my father will love him and he will come to him and make our home within him. You have to trust Jesus enough to give him the deed to your life. So when God says, forgive somebody, I'm going to forgive. When God says, don't sleep with that person, I'm not going to sleep with that person. When God says, do not forgive that person, I will forgive that person. Right? When God says, work hard and don't cheat your employer, I'm going to work hard. I'm going to arrive early. I'm going to stay late. And I'm going to do more than what's asked of me. 
If you do that, my friends, you will get promotions. Hard to get that today, let me tell you. So we will come to him and make our home with him. This is what the Bible says. If you love me, you'll obey my commandments. Right? Maybe, you're, maybe you grew up in a church like that. If you love me. I kind of like doing that. I should become a, you know. It's almost like Klingon. You don't know what Klingon is? Never mind. So if you love me, that's not what it's about. Produce and then I'll love you. No, this is what it's about. If you love me, you're going to obey my commandments. If you love me, you're going to trust me. Trust me. Have you ever tried to tr- help someone that won't trust you? It's virtually impossible. If, this is how you change everybody. You surrender. The Bible says I must forgive. I make a decision to forgive, even though I don't understand it. I make a decision not to do that act. I make a decision to be kind. I make a decision. You see, we can go on and on about this, but you trust God's word. When you trust him, you're giving him the deed to the house. If you'll keep my commandments... And so the Bible says that you be what? Rooted and grounded in works. No, rooted and grounded in agape. Rooted and grounded in love. What's the opposite opposite of pride? Love. I thought it was humility. Well, that's part of love. Love does not demand its own way. Love believes all things, hopes all things, right? Love has no record of wrong. Love does not demand its own way. You want to fight pride in your life? Do it with love. Love is so important. That's what real love. You want to know what love is? Read 1 Corinthians chapter 13. That's love. So that you being rooted and grounded in love. We got to be rooted and grounded in love. What does that look like? Well, I'll show you. You might have heard the red sequoias. These are amazing trees. There's a, actually, that's a person. It's not a stick figure. These things are amazing. Do you realize that some of these trees are over 2,000 years old and they can withstand forest fires? The bark is resistant to most, most fires. It's amazing how these trees are. Now, something else amazing about these trees is, look, if you imagine, this is the Statue of Liberty, uh, that the Coast Redwood is, is actually taller than the Statue of Liberty, taller than the Capitol, and they're 2,000 years old. In fact, there is a tree called Methuselah. I hope it's still there. I believe it is, by the way, which comes from the Bible. The oldest tree that we know in the world is 2,200 years old. California's Redwood National State Parks. I hope to go there one day. I've not been there yet. But there is the tallest or the oldest tree. And what makes these sequoias so strong is the following. They're together in groups. Now, why are they together in groups for? Because the redwoods do not have deep roots. They depend on each other. And that's why they're so strong. What do you mean? Well, let me show you. They have interlocking roots to helping each other out. So you have these huge trees that have these interlocking roots. So when the wind blows, the other one holds the other one down. The other one feels the tension of the other tree and supports it. What would happen if a church would begin to support each other, have interlocking roots where I can help you, you can help me, that we can feel the pull in your life and I can speak into your life. What would happen if a bunch of men, a bunch of guys got together and said, I'm going to be real. I'm going to take off the mask. I'm going to bless people. I'm going to be there for my brother and I'm going to be an interlocking root where we can see our societies change, our school systems change, and yes, our countries change. We need to be interlocked in the love of Jesus Christ. We want to be law. We want to be redwoods. This is what it's called about. And this is how we change. The Bible says, Psalm 22, 12, the righteous man or woman, but here in man, will flourish like the palm tree. Palm tree, by the way, is very flexible. Hello. He will grow like the cedar in Lebanon, which was the strongest and greatest trees of the Middle East. What does it say? Planted. You mean I just can't uproot because I don't like, you know, the worship in the other, the worship of the other church is a little better and the other pastor's hot. (laughs) Our pastor's bald (laughs) and middle-aged. And wears long baggy t-shirts to hide his midsection. 
<laughs> it isn't about that. You're going to be planted, right? Planted in the what? House. Ecclesia, the house of church. House of the Lord. That's what we call the house of the Lord. They will what? Flourish. I mean, the forest fire comes. Ah. We are together. We can handle the fire of culture going the wrong way. We can handle the fire of a bad economy. We can handle the fire of cancer because we're watching out for each other. We're seeing God do a move in our lives. We can handle divorce and we can help marriages come back together because we're interlocked. Do you see how important? That's why we have small groups. It is a, a catalyst for that change. They will flourish in the courts of our God. They will still yield fruit in old age that you be rooted and grounded in love as the worship team makes their way up, please. May have strength to comprehend with all the saints, to understand with all the saints what the breadth, the length, the height, and the depth. This is beyond academia. This is not giving an essay. This is not multiple choice. This is not just regurgitating. We're talking about experiential some people within the church worship experience, how I feel. I want to have the Holy Spirit goosebumps. And I'll run after conference, after conference, after conference, and church after church. I'm trying to get a spiritual high. I'm looking for the next revival. And that's not good yet, my friends. Or I want to learn good doctrine. And I can quote it, but I treat my family like trash. Or I want to be a human being. I want to be in the Lord. I want to worship with all my heart. Oh, my mind. God's okay with you having questions, by the way. We're not asking you to throw your minds out. With all your strength. With all your being. You see, the cross of Jesus Christ is the essence. It's very interesting how the cross represents, in many ways, the vertical and the horizontal. That we talk about what the length is. How, 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 how's the length of Christ? He loves us so much. He came, to, came from heaven to earth, right? And the height and the depth. How deep is it? And to know, to gnosko, to know, to experience the agape of God that surpasses knowledge. It's being. It's experiencing. It's listening. That you may be, what? Filled with all the fullness of God. What's the fullness of God? Can I ever get the fullness of God? Well, you want to know what the fullness of God is? Imagine going to the Atlantic Ocean, having a pail, and going and filling it, and bringing it back. So what the fullness of God is, the accessible. God's accessible. His, his unbelievable love, his wisdom, his power is right there for us. But we need to fill up every day. You know, you, you charge these things every night, right? You have to keep it in the charger. It's annoying. Do you have time to charge up with God every day? To be filled with the Holy Spirit? To Him, in the church, and in Christ Jesus, through all generations. Let's go ahead and read that. Now to Him. Now to Him. That's Jesus. Who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within who? All of Christ in? You see that, everybody? Just letting Christ come. Let him saturate you. When he says whatever he tells you to do, don't try to change your life at once. Just surrender to him. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. All of Christ in all of me. Let's bow our heads. Lord Jesus, all of us in this room, myself included, Father, forgive us. Lord, some of us, we gave our house to you. We gave our life to you. But Lord, we've kind of, uh, kind of kept you out of certain doors and rooms of our lives. Father, in the area of relationships, we said, I'm going to do relationships my way. And we shut that door from you. And Lord, some of us said, I'm going to do money my way. And we shut that door. And Father, some of us are holding bitterness against our parents, against our siblings, against different pastors and leaders. And we've locked that door too. And Lord, some of us, you're only on the porch. 
Father, I pray right now today, in Jesus' name, myself included in this prayer, Lord, I want to say, have the deed. Have, go to every room, every nook, every cranny, every closet, even the pull-down attic. Lord, go up there. In every area, we surrender to you, Jesus. Lord, we want to be all of Christ in all of me.